Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Avi. I'm a grateful alcoholic. <clears throat> Thank you to the group. Thank you to my friend, Young. Um, what, a, what a pleasure it has been in this Zoom era. What a gift it has been, uh, <clears throat> this, uh, these online meetings, in addition to the physical meetings. It will never replace for me the physical, but it's been such a great addition because I get to meet uh, other uh, servant souls that vibrate at the same frequency. Young's one of them. Uh, we got to meet after meeting on Zoom for a couple of years. I went to Birmingham just not too long ago for a conference. We got to meet physically over there, so it's just been a pleasure, brother, to watch you and walk with you. Thank you for doing all that you do and everybody at this meeting. Um, I, was like, I was telling Teresa before this, I feel a little off that it was a long day yesterday. We were at a conference yesterday by the time I came home, and this morning, what I usually do before talks is obviously pray and sit, meditate, and and see what comes, and nothing came. <laughs> so I have no idea what's going to come here. I'm going to kind of try to keep it as short as possible because I'd rather hear what you say and your experience on this reading. Um, how this reading came to me was uh, was a couple of, um, what it was, I think two days ago, Young reminded me, gentle reminder, that don't forget about the about the article. And then uh, right after he said that, I just, I something told me just go on Facebook. I just went on Facebook, and I just saw a member I had posted one of these AA pages that I'm a that I'm a member of uh, this article, and it just it's so fitting for me. It is so fitting for me. So um, I'm going to try my best in the few minutes that I have left uh, uh, to share my experience with this reading. Uh, I believe it's my experience that uh, um, that these are just words on a page, just like the big book, that sacred, beautiful uh, text of ours is just words on a page. It only uh, begins to have depth and weight. It becomes thousands of kilometers deep when a member pours their experience on it, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to try to pour my experience on it and and, and see what comes out of this. Um, is happiness the goal? So <clears throat> I thought so. <laughs> my entire life, I thought so. Uh, I thought happiness was the goal. And I sat uh, even long before I, I was aware or awake to what I was doing, even as a little kid, that's I was trying to just be happy, just have a good day, you know whether it's approval of kids on the street or extended family members or love of parents or when I grew a little, you know, when I grew up a little bit, I was able to get a job and maybe money, a relationship, car, clothes. I always thought happiness was a goal because it's never felt right inside. You know, I didn't know why that was. You guys probably didn't have the language to describe it at that time or the awareness to realize what it really was. You guys taught me about this God-sized hole that I was trying to fill with external things and it just never worked for me. And then when I found alcohol, that was the panacea to all my ills. Dr. Bob talks about that eh? in, his, in his story, the medicine to all my ills, right? And alcohol truly filled that God's high soul, that, uh, that love, the void that I was feeling, that unhappiness that I was feeling for a period of time. And then, and then I chased it into the gates of insanity and death. And for about the last five years of my drinking, um, I, I would drink as much as I could. My body would be drunk, but my mind's still racing. I still want to kill myself. <laughs> I'm still worried about what you think about me, you know? I just never, I just, I couldn't breathe, figuratively speaking, and literally at times. And I kept on doing it. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. Like, I literally chased this drink, the happiness and the drink that I was chasing, into suicide attempt after suicide attempt. Slashed wrist, bottles of pills, exhaust in the hose of the car, <laughs> in the garage, actual suicide attempts. And how cunning baffling this illness is. Because I never want to forget, like, I, it's, it's amazing that, like, there's so many different ways to do talks and topics and stuff like that. I think it's so important because if it's so important to talk about why I'm here, that who I am. I need, I need to know that I'm an alcoholic, that I suffer from this mind-boggling, terrifying illness. You know what I mean? For anything else to make sense, <laughs> right? So suicide attempt after suicide attempt, and I would, they would let me out of the psych ward and, and, or whatever emergency room at the time, and I promised my poor mom that was crying by my bedside, I'm not going to do this to you again, mom. I'm not going to drink again. And two days later, they let me out, and this brain with a virus in it, it would tell me that a drink would fix this. Literally. 
just came off a suicide bed from drinking. A drink would fix this. And I didn't have enough. Uh, what does the big book say on page 24? Man, I wish I could quote better. Uh, I couldn't remember with sufficient force <laughs> the humiliation or whatever that was a week ago or two hours ago, you know? Cunning, baffling, and powerful. I'm powerless against alcohol. I'm powerless. There's a spiritual malady underneath it that, 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 that I was drinking. There's a reason I was drinking it because I was maladjusted to life. Couldn't feel okay inside. And the drink fixed that. But I became powerless over destroying my life and, and, and engulfing any, uh, anyone else whose lives touched my path. I engulfed them, the big book talks about. Destroyed them from my parents to girlfriends to family and friends. You know, and I found you guys. I never looked at it this way, actually. My entire life was chasing happiness. I never really looked at it this way. <laughs> and I found you guys. Uh, loving God brought me to you guys. In 2006, I was 12 step. And, uh, and I fell in love with you guys. I, I was on a pink cloud, they call it, eh? A pink cloud, uh, cloud nine, whatever. Really. <laughs> it was a beautiful thing, man. I fell in love with the fact that I found my tribe. You guys drank like me and you, and you felt like me and you felt like me. But those seeming uh, problems or uh, calamities of life will not destroy you and overwhelming you. You talk with them, uh, about them with levity and joking to help each other with it. Like sort of the article talks about, right? And that was interesting to me. And, 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 and I thought I could keep that here to sobriety that I had for the first five, six months just by coming to a lot of meetings. And I did that. A lot of meetings, really active at the group level. I didn't work any steps, though, eh? I didn't work any steps. It's like it's like if I want to get in real good shape and feel good about my body and, and feel confident by just going to the gym and talking to people and getting inspired <laughs> and going home. That's what I did with you guys. Right? How silly that would be in the physical realm. But this is a life uh, like a vital uh, life giving situation, life losing situation, I'm confused about it. <laughs> Insane alcoholism, man. My last drunk wasn't as bad as the 50 before that. I always say this because it's true. <laughs> it was just one night. Usually it's not just one night. I was in AA for four months, really active in AA, lots of meetings, coffee pot, shaking hands, Ooh, no steps. <laughs> I went out, drank one night, came back in. I passed out and came to, found myself in that in that room that I was renting in a men's recovery home. I, I found myself in an incredible amount of pain, physical, mental, spiritual pain. My body was hurting, my joints were hurting, little physical. My mind was racing. And the hooves of the four horsemen were really loud. Why don't you kill yourself, you loser? They always talk to me. Why don't you kill yourself, you loser? Oh, a drink would fix that. The two messages they always used to always give me. <laughs> you know? My knees got bent, a prayer came out of me. God, whoever you are, whatever you are, please help me. Don't be like this anymore. Please help me not be like this anymore. I'm just tired of me. Whatever this is, man. Can't do it. Can't do it. Loving God caressed me, brought me to you guys. A teacher opened the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with me and poured her experience on it. We went through it line by line. I'm not telling everybody to do that, but it's just my experience. We went through it line by line, did this stuff as outlined to the best of our ability, and I woke up. And I woke up, man. I literally have been set on fire since that day. <laughs> since that day, I've been set on fire. I've been set on fire, but not living a perfect life. <clears throat> I was set on fire, then I got confused a little bit, Alcoholics Anonymous, sober, sponsoring people, going to meetings, talking here and there. I got confused again. This, this, this illness lulled me into a delusion that somehow this is about happiness. <laughs> this is about looking good. Okay? So pl please don't misunderstand. I don't want anyone to just, uh, there's nothing wrong. This is my opinion, okay? So just, there's nothing wrong with chasing happy. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be happy. Everyone should want to be. In fact, the big book says, oh, we're sure God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. <laughs> right? Nothing wrong with that. But see, the way I go about it doesn't work. Because I'm centered in myself. The root cause of my problem is self-centered. So I'm always well, on my own power. I'm drowning in self. I'm, I'm sinking in self. I can't breathe. I'm bondage of self. What's happening to me? How can this benefit me? So when I, I started to go about becoming for a period of time, chasing happiness, just like I did, you know, <clears throat> So if, if I sound good, if I look good, if I get this job, if I get this girlfriend, then, then I'll be happy. Why? Because you'll tell me I'm okay. 
if I have a number of sponsees, then I'll be happy. Why? Because I want to say, look at Ali, he's a spiritual guru, man. And then if they talk about me in meetings, woo! <laughs> I know none of you guys thought I haven't thought like that, but you know, I'm a little bit broken. <laughs> right? Insane. Chasing happiness. Chasing happiness. I think what, what, what I became present to, what, and I'm going to give, I think the best way is just to pour some experience on. Okay, I've been talking about it too much without experience. So, um, I think every single step, every single step is like a spiritual thread that if I follow it, that if I follow it, leads me to the next step and eventually leads me to the ultimate step. Right? I'm not saying this is a graduation. It's a way of life. I gotta, like, breathe it. It's gotta become a part, walking part of my mind and my body. I get that, right? It's, and it's not like I can do any step, uh, in a vacuum, like take it out of context from the other. It's a spiritual movement, a spiritual way of life, these 12 steps, right? But every single step eventually leads me to one step, the 12 step. This is a path of usefulness, not happiness. That's what I have found. When I have become the, the times in my sobriety, in my recovery, when I've become present to the fact that this path is a path of, path of meaning and usefulness, and happiness has become a byproduct of it at times. And, and when I'm not chasing happiness, when I'm not attached to happiness, when, when, when happiness is not there, when despair is there, when sadness is there, when fear, fetal positions in recovery, crying at home is there, I get through it. Because it's not about me so much. It's about God. Can you please remove this selfishness from me and show me who would you have me be? What would you have me do? Because I just want to be useful. I, I made a deal back in the third step. The deal wasn't for me to be happy. You had a beautiful wife and, a, and rich and uh, speaking engagements to become a circus speaker. That was not the deal, man. The deal is to be useful to your other kids. I made a deal. It's right in the third step. I made a deal. I'm going to do your work to the best of my ability perform your work well, and stay close to you, and help your kids, to the best of your other kids, to the best of your ability, my ability. And you take care of the details of my life. There's many areas of life I could talk about as a demonstration of me falling asleep and then God showing me, you know what I mean? My depression I could talk about. My relationship with Ashley, my wife I could talk about. Uh, uh, work I could talk about. So so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Ashley. Okay, let's talk about relationships. My entire life, I was ugly on the outside and inside. I was, and I told you. Nobody wanted to be with me, obviously. Like, you know, I never had long-term relationships. Everything was short-term. I always tried to put up an image. Why? Because I'm chasing happiness. I'm chasing what you can do for me. I didn't know what love was. Love is what you do for me. If you're kind to me, if you acknowledge me, if you praise me, then I love you. If you disagree with me, oh, man. I, I took hostages in relationships. My modus operandi in relationships was I would, it would take me two or three months to unpack this suitcase of crazy that I had inside of me. And when it would get unpacked, it would be like, ah, <laughs> she would be scared, I'd be scared. <laughs> One of us would leave, right? <laughs> and then I would be like, hey, you don't really love me. You don't know what love is. Because if you love me, you would heal these wounds. Self-centered. Relationships are about me getting something, not about giving. Opposite of this path, right? It just never worked. I'm not even saying it's wrong. I'm saying it didn't work. <clears throat> Ashley and I, I learned how to grow in a relationship and love uh, in, in, in a marriage and recovery. <clears throat> I had a few short weeks of sobriety. Ashley had about a year. We knew each other for years. I'm not telling anyone to do this. It's just what happened to us. Okay, that was God's plan for us. We got together. <laughs> We got together, we started dating, we got married. Our relationship, I guess the best way to describe it uh, in the past, especially, was bipolar. Okay, two alcoholics under the same roof, both trying our best, right? But what I mean is one extreme was love and happiness and joy and laughter, just ooh, ecstasy, man. I'm serious, like <laughs> extreme, right? And the other extreme was chaos and fighting and yelling, <laughs> just like my parents, <laughs> just like my parents. I copied what I knew. Subconsciously, I didn't even know, right? Just like my parents. Thank God for the... So, continuously, both of us, clean house, trust God, help others. Clean house, trust God, help others. You know, we had beautiful moments, beautiful times in, in our marriage and then times of chaos, right? And please, in this description, I don't want to have to give the, give, give the impression that anything about my wife or my... I have a beautiful marriage, right? Eh? I'm just telling you, like, uh, this article... 
it got to a point where financial stuff and different stuff, you know, two alcoholics falling asleep under the same roof, it, it, it's not pretty at times, right? It wasn't at least in the past, right? We got separated for a while. I'm so grateful for, uh, and we had troubles for a while, right, on and off, on and off. I'm so grateful for the teachers that are around me, for my sponsor, Butch, for my friend, Teresa, who I didn't want on the call today. <laughs> but she gets on anyways. Because no matter what I go to them with, let's say in this marriage, right, the problems, the calamities, they, sh they share, uh, they allow me to share, they kindly share their experience with it, and they point me to God. They point me to some action, to some inventory, to some amends, to some prayer meditation, to some newcomer. They point me to God because they know that it takes action for me to awaken to the fact that my problems are rooted in self. That love is not about getting. Love is about giving. <laughs> you got it backwards, Ali. You're not there to be served. You're there to serve, <laughs> you know. Throughout throughout the, these those couple of years that we really had our problems, and we had separated for, for, for a year. I was renting a room in a house close to my house right now, the house that we have, because I wanted to be close to my son. I hated her <laughs> for a while there, you know? But here's the thing. I get to be broken, and I, and, I, and, and I don't have to be perfect. Because throughout this whole thing, I was still in it with you guys, you know, doing the best that I can. I ended up in a... It's like I would do inventories and I would wake up for a little bit and I'd feel peace and all of a sudden it would just come back and get me again. These thoughts that it's her fault. She's controlling, she chases money too much, she's mean, she's cruel, she's this, she's that. I was sure my problems are her fault. <clears throat> has to do with her doing. I found myself in the room, in that room that I was renting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So check this out, eh? For years I was chasing happiness, right? And my last drunk, I found myself in a, in a room in a recovery home, and the four, the four horsemen with their hooves, right? Telling me, kill yourself, you lose it, take a drink. Now, a few years down the road, I'm in recovery. I'm sponsoring people. But I'm still chasing happiness in a marriage <laughs> instead of usefulness. What happened was that I found myself in a different room, in a different house, close to my house, and the four horsemen came for a visit. Why don't you kill yourself, you loser? Once you take a drink, a drink would fix that. Crazy, eh? I suffer from alcoholism, man. It's a soul sickness. It's a spiritual malady. It's not a drinking problem. A drinking problem, this would have been the solution. Put down the drink and walk away. <laughs> Go get some marriage counseling. That's a drinking problem. Why don't you kill yourself? You're a loser. Why don't you drink? My knees got bent. A prayer came out of me. God, please remove the selfishness and self-centeredness from me. Show me who would you have me be. What would you have me do, God? I'm tired of me in this marriage. I don't know how to have the marriage. I don't know how to love. I'm just tired of this. It's been my experience that God listens. Okay, this is words describing infinite power are silly. I get it, but that's all I have, okay? It's been my experience that God listens to a broken soul, <laughs> to, a, to a soul in pain because it comes from humility. Tears are a beautiful form of prayer. Help me, God. I don't want to be like this anymore. Whatever this is, I don't want to be like this. The message came. Call somebody. I called this other old timer. Picked up the phone. I shared with him. And I was telling him, man, Ralph, you don't understand. I see this and this and this. He's like, I, 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 I can't. He listened to me for a while. I said, I, I, man, you're going to die like this. I can't listen to this. You got to write some inventories for me. And call me back. I wrote, I took, like, I was crying. I remember I was, I was in that room sober, crying, <laughs> wanting to drink. I prayed God, we this desire to drink from me. I'm writing him. It took me two, three hours to write these inventories. So, right? I call him back. And I'm like, are you ready, Ralph? He's like, you be ready? You done already? I said, yeah, I'm sorry I took so long. He goes, he goes, oh, I thought you were going to take a couple of days. And I realized, no, oh, no. So I read these inventories to him, right? And here's the thing. I've written many inventories on this situation with my wife. I don't know what happened. The accumulation of these. God doesn't make the hard times for, for a broken soul that's seeking. Every single time the Spirit used different teachers, different one of you guys to spoon feed me. And I just woke up on that one. I woke up. And I saw. I saw that everything that I'm complaining about. Like when I say I saw, I'm not talking about 
intellectually so. I'm not talking about little bit so. I'm talking about my heart so. This connected to this. My, my head connected to my heart that I saw. Everything that I'm complaining about with Ashley is me. I'm doing the same thing in my own. I'm not saying she's not wrong. That's not the point. I'm saying my problems are my own making. Everything I'm, I'm, I'm doing with the, to her, with her, in, in my own way. I'm selfish in my own way. I'm self-centered in my own way. I wanted to call only for the depression I face once in a while, but I don't want to give her the dignity to let her heal from the anxiety that she feels sometimes. I want the benefits of having a wife that's a breadwinner, but I don't want to, to deal with the ramifications of the personality type that goes like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like she's a lioness, she's a hunter. Right? Selfish, self-centered. I woke up, man. And what Ralph said is, I don't even have done a six and seven on this. I'm like, what are you talking about, Ralph? I know what six and seven is in the book. That's not say a prayer. No. You're still trying to play God. You're trying to manage this thing. You haven't done a seventh on this. Oh. And I woke up, man. And I woke up. I woke up to the point where I got detached from being married. Well, it looks like this marriage is the only thing I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about work and depression, but I got a few minutes done. That's all good. <laughs> But I'll wrap it up soon. I, well, who was I going? Who am I last? Oh, uh, so instead of practicing principles, uh, principles in a marriage that wasn't working, right? I got detached from being married. All of a sudden, I felt nothing but love. Like not a romantic love, just like, a, just like love for another human being. I just wanted to love on her, and I wanted to co-parent with her. I wanted to be with my son. I didn't want to. And, and then for, for, for a few months, we were just really good together, man. With the help of my sponsor and Teresa, I was just being a better person, really practicing principles in my affairs. And the pandemic hit, right? <laughs> and the pandemic hit, and, and she's like, uh, you know, at the beginning, do you guys remember? And we were like this. We thought everyone's going to die soon, right? So like, actually, we're like, oh, shoot, everyone's going to die. So Ashley said, why don't you just move back home for a little bit? This last little time, if we have together, let's just spend time together, right? And we fell in love, man. We fell in love, a deep sense of love, a spiritual love, not a romantic love. I'm sorry, I keep saying not a romantic love, not just a romantic love. What I'm trying to say is that I've seen, I woke up to this fact. I, I am not privileged. I, I cannot, I cannot be trusted. I cannot handle having normal human romantic love because I am centered in self. But my idea is love. Remember what I told you what you do for me, right? So for Ashley and I, for this relationship to work, God has to be in the middle of this thing. It has to be a constant spiritual experience with us. God has to be everything, not this marriage everything. Our romantic love has, has been arising out of the spiritual love. That's where it has to come from. Every relationship I have has to come from the spiritual relationship with this power, with God. You know? So what happened? Throughout this whole thing, when, as, I was, as I was going through these difficulties with, with my wife, and with, God would send me men or my sponsors, the, the men that I was sponsoring, that I am sponsoring, they would have relationship problems, marriage problems. What happens? I get to share with them openly. I get to be a, I get to be transparent. I show them my wounds. At the same time, do what you do for me. Show them, see, this is how spiritual principles work. They've been working in this marriage. Because the wound is where the light shines through, Rumi says. That's why I'm broken. I'm broken because I'm a servant. I'm supposed to be broken. Nothing's supposed to be perfect. Life is not for me about happiness and how good life is. No, it's about being useful. It's about being useful. I have one purpose in life, to be of maximum service to God and the people about me, to be of maximum service in this marriage, to be of maximum service in a relationship with my son, with my friends, with a man I sponsor, to my sponsor, at work, in AA, maximum service. And I fail at that sometimes, I do. But that's okay, because I'm broken. God doesn't make too hard terms for me. I, I, I have been brought, I've been gifted to a much deeper path, man. Usefulness. The seven-step prayer does not say, my creator, uh, where it say, remove these defects of character, withstand in the way of my happiness, does it? 
my usefulness, <laughs> my usefulness to you, my fellows. That's where I find my bliss. The most difficult times, the deepest depressions, the most uh, fear-induced financial moments in recovery, they have been transformed to bliss when I am present to my assignment for the day. And in order for me to be present in my assignment, I got a clean house, trust God and help us. Clean house, trust God and help us. I got to come to your meetings. I got to be with you. I got to come to this fellowship. I got to be with you. I can't do this on my own either. The step says we, 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 we do this. You know? I don't know where that went, man. God bless you. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.